Hi, today I'm going to be reading uh, The Wild Party by Joseph Moncure March. It was written in 1928, kind of a jazz poem, uh, a poem from the jazz age about low-life underworld and a wild party. Part one. One. Queenie was a blonde and her age stood still, and she danced twice a day in vaudeville. Grey eyes, lips like coals aglow, her face was a tinted mask of snow. What hips, what shoulders, what a back she had. Her legs were built to drive men mad, and she did, she would skid. But sooner or later they bored her, sixteen a year was her order. They might be blackguards, they might be curs, they might be actors, sports, chauffeurs. She never inquired of the men she desired about their social status or wealth. She was only concerned about their health. True, she knew there was little she hadn't been through, so she liked her lovers violent and vicious. Queenie was sexually ambitious. So, now you know, a fascinating woman as they go. She lived at present with a man named Burrs, whose act came on just after hers. A clown of renown, three sheeted all over town. He was comical as sin, comical as hell, a gesture, a grin, and the house would yell. Uproarious, he was glorious, so from the front. People in the wings saw him and thought of other things, coldly, most coldly. Many would say them boldly. Adding in language without much lace, they'd like to break his goddamn face. Ask why? They might be stuck. They would like to, just for luck. But these were men for the greater part. A woman would offer him up her heart, throbbing on a platter. He could bite it and it wouldn't matter. As long as he kissed and held her tight and gave her a fairly hectic night, which he could and would, a man these women understood. Oh yes, Burrs was a charming fellow, brutal with women and proportionately yellow. Once he had been forced into a marriage. Unlucky girl, she had a miscarriage two days later, possibly due to the fact that Burrs beat her with the heel of a shoe till her lips went blue. For a week her brother had great fun looking for Burrs with a snub-nosed gun at the end of which time she began to recover, and Burrs having vanished, the thing blew over. Just a sample, for example, one is probably ample. Two. Studio, bedroom, bath, kitchenette, furnished like a third act passion set. Oriental, sentimental, they owed two months on the rental. Pink cushions, blue cushions overlaid with silk, with lace, with gold brocade. These lay propped up on a double bed that was covered with a Far East tapestry spread. Chinese dragons with writhing backs, photographs caught to the wall with tacks. Their friends in the profession, celebrities for the impression. So's your old man, Isidore, faithfully Ethel Barrymore. On a Chinese lacquer tray there stood a gong with tassels and a brass Buddha, brass candlesticks, orange candles, and art bars with broken handles, out of which came an upthrusting of cherry blossoms that needed dusting. Books, books, my God, you don't understand. They were far too busy living firsthand for books, books. True, on the table there lay a few tattered copies of a magazine, confessional, professional, that talked of their friends on the stage and screen. A Victrola with records just went to show Queenie's art on the man two floors below. Being a person of little guile, he had lent them to her just for a while. Believe it or not, all this for a smile. A grand piano stood in the corner with the air of a coffin waiting for a mourner. The bath was a horrible giveaway. The floor was dirty, the towels were grey. Cups, saucers, knives, plates, bottles, glasses in various states of vileness fought for a precarious space in the jumbled world beneath the basin. 
The basin top was the temporary home of a corkscrew, scissors and a brush and comb. In the basin bowel was a pullman towel, vividly wrought with red streaks from Queenie's perfect lips and cheeks. Behind one faucet, in a strain of rust, spattered with talcum powder and dust, a razor blade had lived for weeks. Beside it was stuck a cigarette stub, and the tub, oh, never mind the tub. On the doorknob, there hung a pair of limp stockings and a brassiere, too soiled to wear. Of the bedroom, nothing much to be said. It had a bureau, a double bed with one pillow and white spread. Their trunks, boxes, a chair, the walls were white and bare. Only occasional guests slept there. Queenie and Burr's preferring air slept with the Chinese dragons instead. Three. Sunday noon, broiling hot. Queenie woke up feeling shot. She lay stretched out on the crumpled bed, naked, slim arms above her head. She stared at the ceiling, she stared at her feet, she stared at the clock and she cursed the heat. Faintly, quaintly, she looked exquisite, saintly. Burrs was up, ugly, silent, unshaven, dressed in a pair of violent pink pyjamas, badly crumpled, his eyes were pouched, his hair was rumpled. He sat brooding like a captive satire over a cup and a percolator. He was gross, morose, the Sunday tabloids spread before him, rather unusually well supplied with murder, rape and suicide. Left him cold, unsatisfied, even the comics seemed to bore him. Queenie lifted her head, a trifle from the bed. Burzy, she piped. Her voice was pitched in a fretful key. His mouth twitched. He was dangerously still by enormous power of will. Her eyes filled with a martyred look. She registered grief and her voice shook. Burzy, sharply. Well, he inquired. Burzy, Queenie is oh so tired. His teeth snapped. He was glittering eyed. For a moment or so, he could not decide whether it would be best to throttle or brain this woman with a nearby bottle. A woman who slept like a corpse under sod and woke up tired, almighty God. His nerves jangled. He saw red. He said nothing, but Queenie did. From the region of the bed, peevishly. Burzy, pour out a cup for me, said she. The hell I will, you lazy slut. Do you think you're the Prince of Wales or what? Tense, silence, foreboding sudden violence. Queenie rolled up onto her side. She looked Burrs over, narrow-eyed. Her eyebrows rose on a vicious slant. Her mouth and chin grew adamant. Burrs was afraid, already routed. He tried bluster. Well, he shouted, glaring but she simply lay there staring. So, for a long, awkward while, at last she smiled a contemptuous smile at nothing. She yawned, she rose, she pulled on a pair of sheer black hose. She rouged her lips, she powdered her nose and kept on going until at last her flesh to the knees was alabaster. Burrs watched. The silence grew. Was she through? Who knew? She thrust one foot in a French-heeled shoe and gave both the critical inspection, never a look in his direction. The silence chilled his brain. Queenie, silence again. Queenie, hell, he was stubborn now. He'd make her talk no matter how. He set his teeth, swallowed his pride, rose, slunk over, crouched at her side. Queenie. He seized her arm, shook it. She may have been pleased, but she didn't look it. Her eyes flashed, no truce. She wrenched her arm loose. Up she leapt, white-faced. He lunged. His arms went around her waist. They tightened. They locked. They crushed her thin. For a moment she writhed. 
Then she gave in. He pulled her backwards and her soft, slim body flew down and covered him. His face was pressed deep in her breast. She loosened, she waited, she lay still, giving his hands and lips their will. She was cold as ice all through it. She had him now and she knew it. His heart quickened, his breath thickened. She covered his mouth with a kiss like flame and he quivered and he gasped and he almost came. Now, swift as a snake, she shifted. Her shoulders rose, her arm lifted. Down she struck. His tight embrace gave, his hands covered his face. She leapt up, fled with hard laughter. Bleeding at the mouth, he rushed after. You rotten bitch, I'll fix you yet. She grabbed a knife from the kitchenette and a brown bottle with a whiskey label, then dodged swiftly around the table. They paused, watched, animal-eyed, furious from either side. Her face was white as though newly plastered. You touch me, I'll kill you, you filthy bastard. The threat was banal, but her tone lent it a quality that showed she meant it. A pause. Well, it was over. My sweetie's bats, but I love her, said Burrs dryly. He smiled wryly. He was wily. Queenie shrugged and took the cue. Ah, nuts and to hell with you, was her not too sentimental retort. Come on, urged Burrs, be a sport. Go on, cutie, drop the knife. Let's call it quits. I like my life. Yeah, said Queenie, I wouldn't choose it. And once for all, I'll tell you what, the next time you call me a lazy slut, if I find a knife, I'll damn well use it. Kick that idea around till you lose it. Having delivered herself of this, she gave him a condescending kiss. She took a cracked cup from the shelf, rattled the percolator, helped herself, sat, sipped, perfect-lipped, legs crossed at ease, engrossed, beautiful. There was a lull, peace. But her face was still white and her eyes flickered with an angry light. At last she gave an odd double nod. She raised her handsome head. She said, Bursey, I think we're about due for a party, don't you? Said Burrs, I do. My God, I haven't been really tight for a week. Let's ask the gang tonight. Part two. One. The gang was there when midnight came. The studio was lit by candle flame. Dim, mysterious, shrouded, unbidden shadow guests swarmed about the room. They huddled, crowded in every corner raised deformed, ungainly shoulders, hideous tall necks and heads against the wall. Enormous blurred hands kept stealing, spider-like, across the ceiling. Crossing with sharp, prismatic masses of light from swaying spectre glasses. The flames flickered, the shadows leapt, they rushed forward boldly, swept triumphant across white faces, wavered, retreated, turned, defeated, and shrank back to darker places. The party was getting underway, stiffly, slowly. The way they drank was unholy. They hovered around the glass-filled tray ravenously like birds of prey, white, intense, with mask-like faces, frozen in rigid, gay grimaces. They chattered and laughed, stony-eyed, impatient, hasty, preoccupied. They drank swiftly, as though they might drop dead before they were properly tight. Christ, what a crew! Take a look at Madeline True. Her eyes slanted, her eyes were green, heavy-lidded, pouched, obscene. Eyes like a snake's, like a stagnant pool filled with slime. Her mouth was cruel, a scar in red that had recently opened and bled. Her body was marvellous. A miracle had fused it. The whole world had seen it. A good part had used it. People bought their seats in advance for $15, glad of the chance to see her dance. Women adored her, less often a man, and the more fool he, she was lesbian. Then Jackie, perfectly formed of face, 
slim, elegant, full of grace, leaving a subtle trail of scent floating behind him as he went. A soft shoe dancer with a special act. New York or Paris, his house was packed. He had two cars. He had been behind bars for theft, public nuisance, rape, once extra for trying escape. Too bad? Nonsense. He was fun, a good sport, the only son of some unheard of preacher father who had kicked him out as too much bother. Of course, the black horse. His lips were jaunty and his gestures too dexterous. A versatile lad, he was ambisextrous. By contrast, Eddie, a short squat brute, gorilla-like, her suit, with eyes deep set, a nose battered flat on one side and teeth scattered. The bones about his cheeks and eyes protruded grimly oversize. A boxer, you'd guess, and right. The man could certainly fight. Aggressive, fast, punishment-proof. Each hand held a kick like a mule's hoof. He might have been champion, he had the cunning, but drink had put him out of the running. Away from the ring, he was easy-going, good-natured if sober, and given to blowing. But after he'd had his tenth scotch, a man to be careful of and watch. And when he was mixing gin and rum, a man to keep well away from. His woman at present was May. She was blonde and slender and gay. A passionate flirt, so dumb that it hurt, and better for night than for day. Behold the brothers Delmano, otherwise Oscar and Phil. They sang, they played the piano, they functioned together with skill. They lisped, their voices were shrill, they were powdered, rouged, sleek of hair, they must have worn pink silk underwear. They clung together with arms laced each about the other's waist, stood around in anguished poses. They rated a shower of paper roses, lavender lights, and the stink of Joss, suffering Moses, what a loss. Watch Dolores, dark, tall, slim, wrapped in a Spanish shawl, with a Spanish comb making a flare of crimson against her smooth black hair. A singer without a voice, but she rode in a Rolls Royce. She made herself up and out to be of Spanish aristocracy. As a matter of fact, if one only knew, she was somewhat Negro and a great deal Jew. In each eye lurked what she thought was a dagger, and she walked with a slink mixed with a swagger. She was swell to sleep with. Her toenails were scarlet. She looked like and had been a Mexican harlot. There were others, of course, a dozen or so. Sally with butter and eggs in tow. He had seen her first two nights ago in the chorus of a summer musical show. And the usual two, loud Jew, theatrical managers stood engrossed, bewailing high production cost. Each of them had suffered most. In 20 minutes, both had lost the sum of $60 million with gestures, after which they sighed and drank panting, tragic-eyed, mopping at sadly wilted collars. Nadine, May's kid sister, 14, no man had kissed her. Excitement made her wide-eyed. She was so thrilled to be there, she could have died. She was quite pretty and she looked older. She knew only what had been told her. And of course, Burrs, natty in grey, with a breath you could smell a yard away, putting his better foot foremost and trying to be the perfect host. The rest were simply repetitions of the more notorious. Slim additions, less practice, Less hardened, less vicious, less strong, just a nice crowd trying to get along. But tonight, Queenie surpassed them all, exquisite in black, radiant tall, with a face of ivory and blurred gold for hair, she was something to kneel before in prayer. My God, Queenie, you're looking swell, quoth Queenie, I'm feeling slick as hell. Two. The only one not on hand was Kate. She was Queenie's red-handed running mate. 
She was rakish and tall, slim-legged, slim-hipped, naughty of eye and expressive-lipped, always in vogue, vicious, capricious, a rogue. But her manner was gay and delicious. She could make a Baptist preacher choke with laughter over a dirty joke. A touch of her flesh would drive you fey. She could pull you in to a state of sin so fast it would take your breath away. And you'd love it and beg her to let you stay. She had wrecked more homes with lust delight than most women could have with dynamite. She was cute, lecherous, lovable, treacherous, and about as healthy as a cobra's bite. Where the hell is that dirty bum, said Queenie. She swore to God she'd come, at which point, bang on the door. Come in, for answer came only a high-pitched, thin laugh cut in half by a scuffle outside. Silence. Come in. The door sprang wide, and there stood Kate with a man by her side both posing heroic, mock-dignified. Ta-da! sang Kate, clarion-toned. Well, ladies, what came with you? she droned. Meet what brought me in a sea-going hack, the boyfriend, Mr. Mr. Black. That's Queenie, this is Burrs, that's Jackie, am I right? My God, there's May, lo May, I'm tight. Queenie came forward. As she came, she ran her eye over Black in professional manner. He was tall, dark, heavy of shoulder, a possible 25, no older. Quietly, even soberly dressed, but perfectly groomed, a habit one guessed. He was carelessly straight, his eyes were bright, his face was tanned and his smile was white. His features were sharply cut and clean, he looked sporting, he looked keen. He made you think of squash rackets, polo and yachting and dinner jackets. And he had that air of poise without pose that only a well-bred person shows. She paused for a second. She looked askance at Burrs, a swift, narrow-eyed glance. She smiled a smile as sharp as a file for the fraction of a while. Again, that odd, slight double nod, the spurs for Burrs. Just what she'd wanted. He'd try to rough her, the bastard. Well, now she'd make him suffer. She had planned this party to put him on the rack, and she'd do it by making a play for black. Her grey eyes widened. They grew dim. Doubtfully, shyly, she smiled at him. How do you do, Mr Black, said she. We're rather informal here, as you see. It was sweet of you to come, I think. Bursey, mix Mr. Black a drink. Black said something polite, astonished. Then, please don't think me rude if I stare, but your hair. Listen to me, kid, Kate admonished. Keep away from that blonde-headed vamp. She was wise to herself when your ears were damp. I haven't a bit of doubt, said Black. He grinned at Queenie, and she smiled Black but with eyes dark, engrossed, as though she saw a ghost. Her lashes drooped, made a violent stain under each eye, like shadows of pain. She held it a second, then seemed to recover. It was deftly done, and it got over. Black said nothing, but his clear eyes took on a gentle, understanding look. Poor child, relentless life had used her brutally, and left her bruised and beautiful. God, she might have been some legendary fairy queen. She moved off, left him staring after. Kate burst out in sarcastic laughter. Well, my God, after all, Queenie takes the brass line shawl. My God, though, hasn't she got the gall making a play for you that way? What do you mean, said Black? What play? Say, kid, I wasn't born yesterday. I like you, kid, and I know I'm tight, but I know what I'm talking about, all right? And let me tell you, she'll get hers if she doesn't watch a step with burrs. See? Let her be. I've told you. Now take it from me. Black said nothing, but he thought hard. So she lived with burrs. He was somewhat jarred. He looked burrs over and he liked his looks about as well as a fish likes hooks. So this was the man of her choosing. Amusing, 
His smile grew knowing, his drink grew small, just a good-looking harlot after all. Three. The candles sputtered, their flames were gay, and the shadows leapt back out of the way. The party began to get going, the laughter rang shriller, the talk boomed louder, and women's faces showed flush through powder, and the men's faces were glowing, and the room was hung with streamers of smoke. It billowed, curled, swung, swirled, poured towards the candle flames and broke. Eyes flashed, glistened, everyone talked, few listened. Crash, a glass smashed, and a woman swore, shrank back, abashed. On the bed sat a girl, alone, white, aloof, like stone. Her mouth was a crimson velvet petal, her hair was beaten from gun metal. Her eyes were deeply set in shadows of violet, and she sat with never a motion like a nun wrapped in devotion. Hungrily, Madeline True eyed her. Slowly she crossed, sank down beside her. Softly she let her hands sink on this girl's hand. The girl did not shrink. She did not speak, she did not stir. She sat staring at a shadow blur that hung like a web to the opposite wall. Gently, Madeline's fingers slid upwards along her slender, small, ivory arm. The lace that hid the girl's bosom rose and quivered. Her petal lips parted, she shivered. Slowly she drew her arm away. She rose and went towards the glass-filled tray. Kate hailed Burrs like a long-lost brother, and she left Black Side to be a red-hot mother. Queenie saw her going. She stopped the Vic and put on a record so blue it was sick. She moved forward swiftly. She stood before Black. Will you dance with me until Kate comes back? And ever so shyly, she smiled. He blushed like a ten-year-old child and nodded, completely beguiled. So dance they did, and dance they could. Queenie was a marvel, and the boy was good. Their step was dreamy and slow and sweeping, and the rhythm was enough to set you weeping. They stood up straight and slim and tall, none of your sexy stuff at all. Queenie was clever. You should have seen them. She danced as though there was a sword between them. But the music swerved. It sank into deep, soft murmurs, as though it were falling asleep. Like a dream, the melody began to float from a saxophone's low-pitched, husky throat. And the rhythm whispered with the fierce unrest of a heart throbbing in a passionate breast. Then Queenie stirred, and the stir went through him. And he shifted his arm and crushed her to him. The shock of her softness stopped his breath. Lights blurred, the floor swam underneath, and Queenie did more than her share. She brushed his lips with her hair. She arched inward, she clung, she pressed her body on his from knee to breast. It was wonderfully timed. About two steps more, they'd have lost their balance and fallen on the floor. As it was, the music quavered, stopped. They disengaged slowly, their arms dropped, and she fed him a blurred, bewildered glance. She smiled, she whispered, our first dance. Let's get our drinks and sit somewhere. Why, yes, if you think Kate wouldn't care. I don't want the child to pull my hair. Queenie took cushions from the double bed. Do you mind if we sit on the floor, she said. So they found a corner, half hidden by a chair, and they dropped the cushions, and they sat down there. Thought black. This is obvious bait. She wants to be kissed. Why wait? His arm went around her. He whispered her name. But Queenie was playing a different game. She registered childlike dismay. No, please, she gasped. Go away. She pushed him off, averted her head. I thought you'd be different, she said. His arm dropped like a shot. He choked and his ears turned hot. And he thought this woman a prostitute. What a cad he was, what a rotten brute. He stammered, I'm awfully sorry, he said, just awfully, really. I lost my head, please forgive me. She lifted wet eyes, she gave out the faintest of sighs. 
Then bravely she winked the tears away. Bravely she nodded. She tried to be gay. She smiled, wistful. She pursed her lips and blew him a kiss from her fingertips. His soul was torn, it bled. He wished to God he were dead. Gloomily, he inspected his feet. You're the sort I've always wanted to meet, he said, and now it's spoiled. You probably think I'm just hard boiled, a rotter, a rounder, a horrible sort of bounder. Queenie viewed him with large eyes, incredulous. My God, what a prize. Well, he said, I guess I'm through. I'll go now if you want me to. Queenie shook her head. She said, no, don't go. You're really very nice, you know. Please be my friend. I need one so. His eyes lit with the pleasure of a man discovering treasure. There's nothing I'd rather be, he told her fervently. Up rose his drink, up rose her drink. Their glasses met with a faint clink. Glass met lip, each took a sip to friendship. Meanwhile, on the double bed, eyes closed in bliss. Burrs and Kate lay locked in a five-minute kiss. Of course, it meant nothing to either one. They were simply snatching a bit of fun. They stirred, they unlocked, they came up for air. Their eyes blurred, the room rocked. They peered here and there. Suddenly, Kate had a moving thought. Where's that cockeyed bastard I brought? Her eyes found the corner and there they stopped. Her head shot forward and her jaw dropped. Well, may Jesus give me grace. He's mushing it up with your angel face. Yeah, said Burrs. He turned to look. His eyes narrowed and his hands shook. Yeah, he said, so they tell us. Kate winked slyly. You're jealous. Jealous? He gave her a glittering stare. You're crazy. What the hell do I care? Four. The candles flared, the shadows sprang tall, leapt goblin-like from wall to wall, excited, delighted, mimicking those invited. The noise was like great hosts at war. They shouted, they laughed, they shrieked, they swore. They stamped and pounded their feet on the floor, and they clung together in fierce embraces and danced and lurched with savage faces that were wet with sweat their eyes were glassy and set. On the bench before the grand piano sat Oscar and Phil, the brothers Domano. They played with fury to the crowd about them, banged and sang and tried to outshout them. They swayed, they bent, they hammered on the keys and shrieked falsetto melodies. Now Jackie stood back of Phil and his hand just wouldn't be still. One clutched Phil's shoulder, the other was bolder. It ran white fingers through his long black hair, then fondled his throat and rested there. Phil's hands played on with agile grace, but he leaned back, lifted his lily-white face. Jack took it between pink fingertips. He bent down and kissed Phil on the lips. Oscar saw, and his hands went crash on the keys. He leapt up like a flash. His voice rose in a thin shriek. You kissed him. I saw you, you nasty sneak. Phil raised his eyebrows. Well, what if I did? A groan from Oscar. He sank down. He hid his face in his hands. He cried. There, there, soothed Phil. He embraced him. He sighed. But Oscar jumped up, tragic-eyed. Don't you dare touch me, he shrilled. Don't touch me. I'd rather be killed. After all that we've been to each other, you offer yourself to another. My God, I can't bear it. I swear it. The onlookers' views were varied and divided, and they offered advice to the one with whom they sided. They grinned, egged them on, cheered, laughed, derided. Finally, Phil, go to hell then, will you? cried Oscar. Oh, you beast, I'll kill you. And he leapt on him then and there. They slapped, they pulled each other's hair. They sobbed and panted, their faces grew smeared with tears and mascara. The crowd cheered, jeered. But Jackie stepped forward, he pushed in between. Look here, he said, you're making a scene. Oscar turned on him, streaming eyed. This is all your fault, he cried. I know, sorry, I didn't think. Let's all get together now and have a drink and be gentlemen instead of bores. 
and you'll sing us that nice new song of yours. After much persuasion, they were pacified. They kissed, they sat down side by side, and Jackie rose on the tips of his toes. How he kept his balance, God only knows. He waved both hands to still the noise. Be quiet a minute, girls and boys. The Brothers Dalmano, stand up boys, bow, have a brand new song, and I'm sure it's a wow. My sweetie is gone is the new song's name. They will now proceed to sing you the same. And I know right now it's going to be grand. Now give these two boys a great big hand. They cheered, they whistled, they began to clap, and Jackie sat down suddenly in Sally's lap. The room stood waiting, the room stood still. In the hush a woman laughed, drunken, shrill. A chord rang out, turned blue and ran through a syncopating vamp, and the song began. The verse was nothing, but the chorus was art, and its music was enough to tear you apart. My cuddlesome, blonde-headed sweetie is gone, doggone. Oh, how I wish I had never been born, I told you, born. She had those kiss-me eyes and lips, what legs, what a pair of hips. I never had a sweetie so bad, so glad, so sad, she drove me mad. Oh, oh, my adorable, toe-headed cutie is gone, she left at dawn. Get out your handkerchiefs, brothers and sisters, and mourn, I said to mum mum mourn. The crowd went wild, they swore it a wonder, they roared and stamped applause like thunder. Even three couples who lay tight clinched on the bed stirred a little as they heard and looked up to see if the place was pinched. Do it again, encore, encore, the brothers submitted, came a hush once more. But just as Phil's fingers were about to light on the keys, a voice came out of the night, and the voice was angry, sepulchral, deep. Cut out that noise, I want to sleep. Silence. For a minute's fraction, the silence of stupefaction. Then they growled, howled, they took action. They swarmed to the window like a subway crush, storming a train in a five o'clock rush. They jostled, stepped on each other's toes, elbowed, clawed, their voices rose, imprecations fiercely applied. They thrust grim, furious heads outside. Night. And against this night, the steep black neighbouring walls shot up out of sight. Sinister, silent, cold, asleep. They peered up at the slanting face of stone. Across the gulf a window shone, square yellow, and they shrieked, There's the fellow! A man's figure appeared, stood set against the light in silhouette. Again the voice, Cut out that noise! You bastard, who the hell are you? My God, it's only half past two. Pull in your neck. Go soak your head, were among the more polite things said. You're keeping decent people awake. Ah, oh, shut up. So's your Uncle Jake. Decent, roared Eddie. Yes, decent, I said. Come here and I'll break your lousy head, you cockeyed son of a bitching scut. Do you think you own this town or what? Yeah, I guess you're pretty tough said the voice, sardonic. Now, can that stuff. I've asked you decently to stop. If you don't, I'm going to get a cop. You can have your cop, you naughty boy, shrilled May, and the others roared with joy. You heard me. The silhouette disappeared. The victors catcalled, hissed, jeered. The light across the way went out. They pulled in their heads. They stood about. They grinned with lurid epithets. They said what they thought of silhouettes. He wants to sleep, the dear sweet bastard, sneered Eddie. The guy ought to be plastered. You can have your cop, see, I told him. Yeah, great stuff, kid. That'll hold him. You piped him down, May. So, say, you're swell. Be quiet, yous. Say, let's raise hell. Burrs turned, a group or two away, stood black and queeny, intimate, gay, he stopped, he eyed them. For a minute, a mist seemed to hide them. And Queenie's hand rose, made a white streak against the tan of the stranger's cheek. Burr's eyes narrowed, his brows met. The palms of his hands grew cold with sweat. 
Then his eyes grew sharp, bored them. He shouldered his way toward them. Queenie? She turned. Oh, hello, Burrs. It was coolly delivered. His mouth quivered. Queenie, come here. She turned white. Just a minute, she said to Black. I'll be back. She stepped aside with Burrs. Well, her tone was as hard as a steel bell. His stare smouldered. His voice was rough. Lay off that stuff. What stuff? What the hell do you mean? Are you trying to make a scene? But her eyes glinted, her white cheeks tinted. So Burrs felt the spurs swell. She'd give him a gaudy taste of hell. You know what I mean. Lay off that guy. Why? Because I tell you to. Yeah, and who the hell are you? A pause. Drop it. It's the bad news. Flashed Queenie. I'll do what I damn well choose. Not if I know it. He seized her wrist, gave it a twist. She flinched and made a low wail. Black stepped up. He was ghastly pale. He gave Burrs one knife-like glance, then turned to Queenie. Would you care to dance? Burrs watched them go with outthrust head. He sneered. He joined Kate on the bed. Five. The candles flared, their flames sprang high, the shadows leaned dishevelled awry, and the party began to reek of sex, white arms and circled swollen necks, blurred faces swam together, locked red hungry lips, closed eyes rocked, white shoulders burst their ribbon bands, rose bare to passionate fumbling hands, white slender throats curved back beneath, attacking mouths that choked their breath. They murmured, they gasped, they lurched and poured and grasped. The bed was a slowly moving tangle of legs and bodies at every angle. Knees rose, legs in sheer stockings crossed, clung, shimmered, uncrossed, well lost. Skirts were awry, black arms embraced white legs naked from knee to waist. Madeline true and the girl like a nun lay deep in cushions locked as one. Madeline's uncovered shoulder shone through gunmetal hair, dully like bone. The girl's face was hidden, pressed deep in a slow, uneasy breast. Dolores had broken her comb. She wept to be taken home. She shook off a shoe, she pulled off a stocking. A young man joined her and they sat there rocking. They stared sadly at her scarlet nails. The young man wept. She burst into wails. She hid her face on the young man's shoulder. What could the young man do but hold her? Her nails were his secret passion, he told her. She seemed to believe it. They clung, they kissed. Shortly they left together, unmissed. The bedroom door swung open wide and a girl sauntered out with a man at her side. They kissed in a matter-of-fact way, and were mildly gay. His suit was badly out of press. She tried to smooth her crumpled dress with small success. He pulled his tie back in its place. She rouged her lips. She powdered her face. She rearranged disordered hair. What had been going on in there? Everyone knew who'd noticed the two, and nobody seemed to care. Over blurred keys swung Oscar and Phil, their hands were numb, they had lost their skill. With faces ashen and smiles set, they played a duet. Their fingers slipped, their fingers stuck, mangled the jarring notes they struck. They clattered, they rumbled, the rhythm staggered and stumbled. Through all this sound, the Victrola kept flinging dim snatches that had no end, no beginning. Three couples circled, slowly clinging. Backs to the room, sprawled on the floor, Black and Queenie sat once more. Drinks stood beside them, they slouched at ease, her head rested on his drawn-up knees. And this was all right, quite. When people are sworn friends, all carnal thought ends. Sex is despised, you'd be surprised. So then they sat, and his fingers played gently with the blur her gold hair made. From time to time they would brush her cheek. Once in a while each would stare and smile. When the spirit moved them, they would speak. 
Now black looked her a soft, adoring kiss. It seems so queer, finding you here like this. It's wonderful, he hesitated, shy. It's hard to say, I don't know. You and I and all this noise back there. A frown, a stare. Perhaps all that's the world and we don't care. Just being here together makes it seem unreal somehow. It's rather like a dream. She nodded. She closed her eyes and opened them. Each eye was like a water-misted gem. She sighed softly. She smiled. You're a sweet child. With eyebrows raised, she shook her head a little, as though amazed. Again he scowled. He took a longish drink. Don't think me rude. You're marvellous, I think. You're much too fine for what's around this place. This burrs, for instance. I'd like to smash his face. Twisting your arm. He's yellow, I'd like to bet. Fiercely, he struck a match for her cigarette. Then Queenie gave him a queer look. Her voice spoke and her voice shook. When I first met Burrs, he was grand, you understand? As nice as a man could be. He was sweet to me. I was sick and awful lonely and tired. I had no show. And Burrs is the sort who pretends he wants to be just friends. I was only 16. How could I know? She shrugged. It seems ages ago. Her mouth drooped, her lashes fell. You've no idea, I've been through hell. What good does it do to say I'm through? Who have I got to turn to? Bravely she smiled, poor battered child. Tears filled his eyes to overflowing. He turned his head to keep them from showing. He cleared his throat, his eyebrows met. You've got me always, don't forget. Dear boy, she whispered, her fingertips rose in his hand and met his lips. From time to time, lying on the bed with Kate, Burrs raised a disheveled head and scowled at a blurred gold hair on a pair of wavering knees. The edge of the chair cut off the rest. What went on there? Burrs trembled. He fell sick. He ached for a bottle, a whip, a stick. He'd batter that bastard green and blue before he was through, and Queenie too. Lie still, Burzy. Kate's hand pressed his hot head back against her breast. Six. The candle flames stood stiff and tall, and the shadows lay overlapped on the wall. A candle guttered, its flame died, the shadows rushed in from every side. A sinister, swift procession, taking grim possession. The noise dropped to a strange, jumbling, low-pitched sound like a distant mumbling. Over this blur the Victrola threw incessant music, soft and blue. Under the grand piano were curled Oscar and Phil, dead to the world. They sprawled like corpses, their pinched faces showed ghastly white in unrouged places. Everyone else is awful tight. Yes, sir, said Jackie. As for me, drink all night. Yes, sir, said Jackie. Mix them too, gin, whiskey, wine. 25, 30, still feel f fine. Yes, sure, said Jackie. So what's your use drinking? Makes your me mad. Makes no difference how many have had. No, sure, said Jackie. His eyes blinked, his eyes shut. He mumbled something, no one knew what. His mouth opened and his face grew haggard. He lurched forward, swayed, staggered. Put out a hand, found nothing to hold, sank to the floor, and passed out cold. Nadine, May's kid's sister, vanished. No one missed her. Suddenly a scream shot out. No, no! Heads lifted, peered about. Again the scream of fear. May! May leapt up, swaying. Nadine lay on the floor, half hidden by a man in grey. Her slim legs kicked. She tried to seize her skirt and pull it down to her knees. May rushed forward. Eddie! But he was there already. His hand swept down, his grip grew tight on the man's neck, his knuckles showed white. His shoulders heaved with one drag, he pulled the man up like a limp rag. The man's head rolled from side to side, he stared at Eddie, vacant-eyed. You bastard, you fooling with a kid, snarled Eddie. I'll show you, and he did. His shoulders swung, his fist drew back, shot out, struck with a dull smack. 
back when the man's head. He spun where he stood. He fell flat and lay there, his face oozing blood. The bystanders murmured in awe. Eddie thrust out his jaw. A woman laughed. His ear caught the sound. He snarled, ducked his head, swung swiftly around. Who are you laughing at, you tart? I'll break your goddamn face apart. His lips curled and his fang-like teeth gleamed crooked and savage underneath. His shoulders began to twist. Slowly he circled each fist. He crouched, his eyes shone red. Grimly he said, fooling with a kid. He scowled. Come on, you bastards, fight, he howled. I don't like you and I don't know you. And now, by Christ, I'm going to show you. Among those present were Queenie and Black. They stood in the circle behind his back. Queenie turned white. She whispered, slopped. He'll kill somebody if he's not stopped. Black heard and his muscles tightened. Eddie advanced and the circle gave, frightened. Black stepped forward with one hand. He grasped a slim empty bottle. The watchers gasped. They waited, fascinated. Suppose Eddie turned. They held their breaths and their sharp eyes burned. Black leapt. The bottle glittered, flashed, crashed on Eddie's head, smashed. Eddie grunted, his eyes shut. He sagged like a puppet with its knee strings cut. His arms swung limp, his face turned white. He rocked, fell forward, went out like a light. The watchers cheered, they scattered for drinks, but May leapt forward like an angry lynx. She screamed, she clawed, she almost tore Black's clothing off. She sobbed, she swore. You hurt my man, you bastard, you. Black held her arms, what else to do? Let go my arms, you cockeyed swell. Let go, God damn your soul to hell. She wrenched free, struck him once, then fell on Eddie's back, writhed like a snake and sobbed as though a heart would break. At intervals, she would caress poor Eddie's head, shriek he was dead. Then little by little, her sobs grew less. Fainter and fainter, they stopped. She sighed and her head dropped. Her eyes shut, her breathing grew deep, her lips parted and she lay asleep. Burrs had been watching. He stood there with dishevelled hair, feet apart, shoulders stooping, hands in his pockets, head drooping, furious, white. His eyes had a glittering light. Queenie joined Black. They came his way. Burrs stiffened and his face grew grey. They drew abreast, they made to pass, with cold shoulders and eyes of glass. Burrs snarled, he turned, he tried to shoulder Black aside, but Black stood rigid, cut from rock, and Burrs recoiled, staggered from the shock. Then they passed on, not a word, as though nothing at all had occurred. Burrs raised clenched fists, but his guts turned hollow, he watched them go, and he dared not follow. He shook, his face began to twitch. I'll fix you plenty, you son of a bitch. In a corner, a group well under the weather put arms across shoulders, thrust heads together. With mournful voices, they howled that fine, heart-rending song, Sweet Adeline. Their voices wailed from quivering throats and clung fondly to the long, sad notes. They swayed, leaned backward, closed their eyes in sour attempts to harmonize. Seven. Now, outside in the night, a window suddenly blazed with light. The silhouette again, about to complain. But this time no sepulchral voice objected to the noise. The shade stayed down against its glow. A huge shadow moved to and fro. The shadow sharpened, shrank, made a clear black image on the shade. In pantomime, a man was shown talking over the telephone. Eight. Black took a drink as they passed the table, a long one, a strong one, then suddenly felt unstable. The room blurred, the room receded. Another drink was what he needed. So he poured it out and he took it. His head buzzed and he shook it. Let's go sit, he suggested. Let's talk. It became somewhat of a problem to walk. They moved around the corner chair with care. He stumbled over a leg, I beg. 
He lapsed a second. He shook his head, recovered. I beg your pardon, he said. Queenie's giggle was delicious, light. Oh, I'm all right, he said. Quite, but I think I must be tight. The words seemed out before he could speak. They sounded far off, strangely weak. They both sat down in the usual place. She arranged her skirt. He pushed a rough hand over his face till it hurt. There, now, he felt much better. He couldn't get drunk, having just met her. With a sigh, she settled her head on his knees and wriggled a little till she felt at ease. She smiled. Don't let's talk, she said. Let's be quiet for a while instead. So there was silence there. His fingers played through her golden hair. She closed her eyes, her head swirled. Music came faintly from another world. She forgot Burr's. Her revenge grew dim. This man wanted her, and she, him. She had played, she had won, but she was caught. Her body ached madly at the thought. What a man this was. He seemed able to bring her heart leaping up with a touch of his finger. She smiled like a child in its sleep. His hand left her hair. It began to creep with gently moving fingertips over her eyes, felt her lips parting them, touched the perfect teeth that lay underneath. Lightly his hand began to float over the smooth white skin of her chin, then suddenly came to rest with its palm pressed, soft and hot on the pulse of her slender throat. She gave a sound like a sob. Her body began to throb. Some wire inside her broke with a snap and her head slid slowly to his lap. For a while they were motionless, flushed, hushed. Slowly the air about them became too thick to breathe, heated by flame. Their hearts pounded till their brains shook. Blood roared through their veins like a swollen brook. His fingers ached to feel fresh, cool flesh. His hand waked. It discovered her shoulders began to explore under the edge of the gown she wore. The edge of the gown was drawn taut across white flesh. His knuckles caught. The fingers began to retreat in defeat. Her head stirred in his lap. She undid a shoulder strap. Slowly his hand sank out of sight. His heart pounded. His throat grew tight. His fingers fumbled at her brassiere. It loosened. He paused. He did not dare. Then his hot hand cupped her breast suddenly and came to rest, ecstatic, frightened. But her hand covered his and tightened. She gasped, started, she flushed, her lips parted. Unevenly her bosom lifted and sank. Her hand rose, it drifted, light fingers slowly across his face. Their breaths whispered, they swirled in space and the soft, hot vortex of desire sucked them down, gasping on fire. His eyes opened through misty light, her red mouth quivered in a blur of white. Down drooped his head. His breathing grew hoarse. Suddenly, their mouths leapt, met with a force that bruised their lips, crushed them thin. Their bodies stiffened, and their cheeks sank in. Tighter, tighter, their faces hardened, grew whiter, tighter till every nerve and vein was shot with sharp exquisite pain sounds blurred the room began to sway queenie tore her mouth away she gasped buried her face in his breast for a moment he held it there tight pressed then she raised her head and shook it she rose to her knees put a hand out he took it they stood up clinging they kissed they drew apart she took his wrist and put that arm about her waist, then hers about his, so tightly laced they stood, her head dropped on his shoulder. I love you, he told her. She smiled dimly, they kissed, the room was hung with amber mist, exultant eyed side by side, they floated dreamlike across the floor towards the bedroom door. No one stared, no one cared. Burrs, to hell with him. As they passed the bed, she glimpsed his head, face up, white, dim, eyes closed, dishevelled of hair, mouth open, throat bare. The door opened, it closed behind them. Jet black darkness swept up to blind them, 
and the air was strangely fresh and sweet. They stood blinking, they swayed on their feet, and blank silence wrapped them in. Little by little, the dark grew thin. A window glimmered with faint light. The bed made a dim, soft blur of white. They lurched forward, stumbled round a chair, staggered to the bed, and fell down there. Nine. Some love is fire, some love is rust, but the fiercest, cleanest love is lust. And their lust was tremendous. It had the feel of hammers clanging, and stone and steel, and torches of the savage, roaring kind that rip through iron and strike men blind, of long trains crashing through caverns under grey, trembling streets like angry thunder, of engines throbbing and hoarse steam spouting and feet tramping and great crowds shouting, a lust so savage they could have wrenched the flesh from bone and not have blenched. 10. The studio flickered with uneasy light. The two sunken candles made a fight against grim, overwhelming night. Their flames flared, whirled up, gyrating, and a crowd of shadows hovered, waiting. The curtains shivered with a sudden chill. They stirred a little on the windowsill, then billowed and flapped inward, blown by a wind that smelled of damp stone. The room was filled with a stale reek. It looked dishevelled, sordid, bleak. Figures sprawled out, flat on their backs. Their faces were death masks in dirty white wax. The table was a wreck. Bleared glasses stood half empty, bottoms stuck to wood. Cigarette stubs, ashes, bits of bread, bottles leaning, prostrate dead. A pink stocking, a corkscrew, a powder puff, a French heel shoe, candle grease, a dirty cup, an agate saucepan, bottom up, and a wet towel with a stained border, all stirred together in wild disorder. Propped in a corner, two men stood giving each other a lecture on the high cost of living. Horribly tight, equally polite, each insisted the other was right. They stood there mumbling, gesturing, swaying, Neither one knew what the other was saying. The Victrola played steadily. Beside it sat a white-faced youth with a battered hat, a slant on his frowsy, dishevelled head. Obviously, he wished he were dead. He sat hunched over, staring at the wall, with eyes that saw no wall at all. With half of one large foot, he kept the music's rhythm. He wept. The record played on each time it ended. He would look up startled, greatly offended. He would then rise with streaming eyes, carefully with a face of pain. He would start the same tune over again. The double bed was a tangled heap of figures interlocked asleep. Limp arms lay flung in all directions. Legs made fantastic intersections. White faces lay tossed back, mouth gaped, hideous, black. Collars hung loose, white bosoms lay bared, one sleeper's eyes were open, they stared up, glassy, unfeeling, at something beyond the ceiling. A woman had taken off her gown, she lay with drawn up knees in the heliotrope chemise, her flesh was tinted a delicate bronze brown. With his head hanging across Kate's knee lay burrs, he slept uneasily. From time to time his body twitched as though it itched. Sleeping on her back just next to them lay a girl like a flower with a broken stem. Her knees stood in the air, from hip to knee her legs were bare. Her head rested in a pool of fair rippling hair. Suddenly she sighed, rolled over. She clung to Burrs like a long lost lover. Burrs stirred, his legs shifted, he moaned, he groaned, his head lifted. He pushed the girl aside and sat up, crimson-eyed. The room rocked, hammers knocked inside his skull. It threatened to split. None of his clothes seemed to fit. His mouth and throat were foul cotton. God, he felt rotten. He writhed out to the edge of the bed and sat there hunched, clutching his head. But not for long, something was wrong. Suddenly, he had a thought. His head lifted. He grew taut, 
He peered over at the corner chair, looking for knees and blurred gold hair. They were not there. His throat grew tight, his face turned white, his eyes narrowed, vicious, suspicious, not so good. He rose, he stood, up, aching, shaking. He staggered to the corner, gripped the chair and peered behind it. They were not there. Two empty glasses, two pillows pressed flat, showed where Queenie and Black had sat. A litter of ashes lay around them. So this was the game. God, wait till he found them. He clamped his teeth together and ground them. His back straightened, he snarled, he wheeled. Around and around the room he reeled, stooping, peering at white faces that lay turned up in shadowy places. Swifter and swifter he went, sinister, silent, intent. At last he straightened, he swore, baffled, whiter than before. They were not there. Then, where? He went to the table to get a drink. He must think. He stared at the drink. He stared at the floor. He stared dully at the bedroom door, with eyes wide blank. His eyes swerved down. He drank. Then something moved in his brain. His eyes shot up again and stared gleaming at the bedroom door as though he had never seen it before. Each eye suddenly narrowed to a slit. His heart jumped. So that was it. He shook and his ears rang. He put down his glass with a bang. His face was as white as though acid had bleached it. Slowly he stepped towards the door reached it, turned the knob, thrust the door wide, stood on the threshold and peered inside. Dim light from the door streamed over the bed. He saw locked figures and a golden head. He felt sick. His breath came quick. The door shut behind him with a soft click. Silence. The pair on the bed sat up. Who's there? Queenie said. A black shape stirred near the door. Who's that? Sharper than before. Who the hell do you think, you whore? Silence, then sharp, clear. Burrs, get out, do you hear? Get out like hell, his choking laugh. I'll break your goddamn neck in half, you dirty bitch. His voice grew shrill. Came Black's retort, the hell you will. Black rose, the shadow sprang from the door. Black struck, Burrs reeled, he crashed to the floor. One hand reached slowly up to seize the bureau's edge. He got to his knees. Get up, snarled Black, with his fist drawn back. I'll teach you to call that girl a whore. Silence. In the darkness, a bureau drawer rattled, thumped. Burrs thrust a hand in. Up he jumped. Something in his hand made a dull gleam. Look out, shot Queenie's warning scream. Look out, he's got a gun. Look out. Black made for him with a shout. The gun roared, but he missed. Black caught him by the wrist. He wrenched till the bones began to crack. The gun dropped. Black snatched it, stood up, lurched back. The gun flashed, crashed, staccato and vicious it spoke. Silence, darkness, the air smelled sharp with smoke. Burrs stood stock still. He whimpered faintly. He cocked his head to one side, quaintly. Suddenly he staggered, fell on the bed. He groaned, an arm rose, dropped. He was dead. Burrs, snapped Queenie. Kurt, Burrs, are you hurt? She leaned over, shook him, shrank back. Her jaw dropped. She stared up at Black. Then, Christ, you've killed him. Look what you've done. Beat it, you fool. Don't stand there. Run. If they get you, you'll get the chair. Run, get out, take the gun. Don't let them catch you with it. Run, do you hear? Run. Kiss me before I go, he said. Her hands flew up, beat at her head. God, what a fool, you make me sick. Kiss me. All right then, come on, quick. For a moment their lips met, cold, salty with sweat. Feet trampled in the hall outside. What's that? gasped Queenie, terrified. He let go turned, lurched towards the door, through darkness over a swaying floor. A crash, the chair, he almost fell. 
Christ, he mumbled, what the hell? Jesus Christ, I've hurt my shin. The door sprang open and the cops rushed in.